This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace, mercy, peace, and blessings to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and welcome to worship. We invite you to go to the worship tab on our website where you will find two things. One, a virtual visitor card. If this is the first time that you're worshiping with us, we'd love to get to know you. And two, a virtual prayer request card where anybody can go and enter in whatever is on your heart or on your mind or on your plate. Send it in so that Tommy and I can be praying for you with greater specificity. In your happenings email, there is an invitation for you to participate in enhancing our Easter joy on Easter morning by recording yourself doing two things. One, saying, He is risen indeed in response to my prompt, Christ is risen. And two, offering up a video where you complete this sentence, Easter means to me fill in the blank. So if you're willing to say, he is risen indeed, if you're willing to let us in on a little bit of your life and reflecting on what Easter means to you, check out that happenings email for clarity on the question and also clarity on the mechanics of filling out your um, the form to submit and also submitting your video. And thank you in advance for sharing your presence and your voice and your heart with your family of faith. This is how we grow closer together and have an even larger, deeper, wider experience of God. As we transition from arriving here to being here, let us hear the words of Jesus himself in the Gospel of John, when he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Confident in Christ's promises, in the hope of eternal life, which has already begun. Let us prepare our hearts for the worship of Almighty God. Thank you. 
We gather in the season of Lent, a time to examine our hearts and our lives and journey with Christ throughout the suffering of the world. Let us pick up our crosses and follow Christ. The path of discipleship is lined with God's love. God has marked us as beloved dust. United in one spirit across space and time, let us worship, worship God. Loving God, giver of all light and life, you sent Jesus Christ into the world, not to condemn, but to save. Help us lift up the light of Christ so that the world might believe in him and receive the gift of eternal life. Through Christ, the light of the world, amen. Of death. 
A scripture lesson for today comes to us from John chapter 3. Jesus has just been visited by the Pharisee Nicodemus by night, who comes under the cover of darkness to ask Jesus' Jesus questions about who he truly is and to share a sense of what Nicodemus is starting to believe around what that means. So picking up kind of mid-sentence with Jesus, listen now to God's word. Jesus said to him, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already because they had not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come into the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Here ends our reading. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We've likely all had times when we were convicted around a matter in a way that led to a change in our lives, a conversion, as it were, and healing, as we began to see life in a totally new way way. I remember when I first strolled up to the docks on the Chattahoochee River as a freshman in high school and saw the slender racing shells in the water, long oars, and students from all over the county who had shown up for orientation for crew. I was converted on the spot to rowing. Years later, my heart still races when I see the sport. I remember too For the entire final semester of my eighth grade year, our science teacher had been talking up the fact that we'd be dissecting a shark for the last day of our anatomy and physiology class before summer vacation. My classmates and I were so excited and the envy of our peers. When the day arrived and the shark, just about two feet long, lay before us, I felt a mixture of awe and sadness. But then its, its smooth abdomen was opened only to reveal that the shark had been pregnant. Its dead babies were removed and passed around. As I choked back tears and stared at the tiny lifeless body in my hand that never stood a chance against humans, I was converted on the spot to conservation and a commitment to protect God's vulnerable, voiceless creatures and creation. In both of these instances, for vastly different reasons and in vastly different ways, the two primary elements of my conversion, as it were, were conviction and healing. As a high schooler wondering about her place in the crowd, I was convicted by the discovery of a sport that didn't go along with the crowd and healed by the discovery that I didn't have to go along the crowd with the crowd either in a way that led to newness of life for me. Holding that dead baby shark against the backdrop of its mother's gutted, lifeless body, I was convicted of our collective unworthiness of their sacrificed lives and subsequently healed of my alienation from creation as I got more engaged with it, with the accompanying recognition that to be estranged from the earth in all of its fragile, vulnerable, miraculous magnificence is to be estranged from ourselves and from God in our equally interconnected neighbors. This led to a kind of new life. So it is 
that in this text, Jesus is speaking about the two primary elements of conversion initiated by the crisis and the joy of him in the world, the elements of conviction and healing. He references Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, as seen from the book of Numbers chapter 21. The Israelites are being led through the wilderness by Moses, subsisting on a daily diet of dependence upon God and manna. And then Numbers tells us this. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from among us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Conviction and healing. God makes it so that the only way for the people to be healed and live is to look squarely at the consequence of their sin that was killing them. God uses harsh means to deliver an important lesson. In the same way, Jesus takes the image of the serpent's body on a pole and refigures it in Nicodemus's imagination into his own body on a cross. Though Nicodemus couldn't possibly have appreciated what this would mean at the time, Jesus foreshadows his own brutalized, lifeless form that people must look upon to see the consequence of their sin that was also killing them so that they could experience conviction, turn their lives in a new direction, and be healed in a way that would lead to new life. What Moses did with the serpent and Jesus did with himself has happened in other places in history. Emmett Till's mother did this very thing when she insisted on a public open casket funeral for her unarmed 14-year-old black son mutilated and lynched by two armed white men in Mississippi in 1955. She lifted up her boy's body and allowed her own grief to be seen so that people must look upon the consequence of the collective sin of racism and be convicted in a way that would hopefully cause lives and minds to be changed and lead to the healing of a divided nation and new life. Lent does this too. It forces us to stop and really look at the consequence of sin in our lives individually and collectively. The consequence certainly of things done or left undone that might separate us from God or others or creation, but also the brokenness and internal dispositions that might be alienating us from ourselves, others, creation, or our sense of God's nearness, serving as obstacles to relationship. If Lent didn't make us pause to do it, if the church in calling us to confession didn't make us pause and do it, we probably wouldn't for fear of what we will see when we do. Jesus names this very inclination when he says, For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. We all have aspects of ourselves we'd love to keep in the shadows, not hoist up on a pole for all to see. 
What Jesus is saying to Nicodemus feels like a harsh means to get an, at an important lesson. John 3.16 has probably been weaponized more than any other passage of scripture to try to win conviction and conversion. But what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus what John 3.16 and this entire passage is saying to us is not turn or burn. It is proclaiming good news. If Jesus was starting from the premise of God as a disappointed parent waiting to scold or outraged judge waiting to sentence or bloodthirsty egomaniac demanding submission and obedience, then yes. His message sounds exclusionary and harsh, convict and convert. But this is not the premise about God from which Jesus is speaking. The premise about God from which Jesus is speaking is that God is love. That everything God is, is love. That everything God desires is love. That everything that motivates God is love. That everything that will come of life with God, no matter how venerable or miserable the terms of relationship that we offer God may be, is love. The message that Jesus is sharing with Nicodemus the message that Jesus is sharing now with us is that all of it, all of it, Jesus, the agonized movements of Holy Week soon upon us, the cross, this message, all of it is about healing and new life. And the pathway to healing and new life that leads through direct recognition of and confrontation with the consequence of our sin and brokenness that is killing us personally and collectively at any number of levels, literal and figurative. A recognition that leads to conviction that draws us out of the shadows only to find not condemnation in the fires of God's judgment, but healing in the light of God's love in a way that leads to new life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. All Jesus is is what God has been all along, an agent of creation and recreation. And all Jesus is doing is what God has been doing all along. And that is speaking into the darkness and calling out the light entering into chaos and bringing forth order, taking the very thing we think God hates and using it as a means of demonstrating God's love, showing up at the moment of death, literal, figurative, circumstantial, and by God's presence, making it an occasion for rebirth into new life. Turning with his presence, crisis into joy. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Nicodemus visited Jesus in the darkness. Let Jesus come and visit you in yours and lead whatever is hiding and estranged, broken and wayward, fearful and ashamed, contorted and violent within and around you into God's presence, where you will find not judgment or condemnation, but healing and life. Won't you welcome him, the one who is crisis and joy? Amen.
In response to the word proclaimed, let us affirm our faith using words from a brief statement of faith, saying, We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. An everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Hi, I want to talk a little bit about my involvement with the Durham County Detention Center. And I'll start by quoting Matthew 25, 36. I was in prison and you came to me. I remember being a little girl at First Baptist Church and the older guys of the church would go every Saturday morning out to Butner Prison Camp to visit the inmates. And I thought that was very cool. I never did it. I just thought it was a very Christian thing to do. Fast forward oh, about 50 years, and we had a friend from uh, our church, many of you know, who ended up in the Durham County Detention Center. And I realized from that experience how important it was not to forget people who were there. It mattered so much to him that I visited him, that I wrote him. Many of you wrote him. I put labels with his address on it out on the counters and friends at Trinity Avenue picked him up and sent him cards and letters, basketball stories from the newspaper. It just mattered to be remembered. And when he emerged from that situation, I had a different appreciation for what I could do to help someone who was incarcerated. So I got involved with the um, I volunteered to be on the Sheriff's Advisory Committee that was being formed. I'm now in the second year of that, working with Sheriff Burkhead and the Sheriff's Office manages the detention center. So I've learned a lot about what little things we can do to help. For example, right now, they're all locked down with this you know, COVID stuff. They can't even really leave their cells much. 
they've all got a radio, but they don't have any batteries and the batteries are absurdly expensive. But we can send them batteries, 50 at a time from Amazon, and they'll give them to the people there. So that's an easy thing to do. But I've also gotten involved with a jail ministry team, which is really managed out of St. Phillips and White Rock and some other churches. There are a couple of others at Trinity Avenue who are doing this every week. The men and women at the Durham Detention Center can sign up for a prayer visit. It's 10 minutes. They just want someone to listen to them for a few minutes and someone to pray with them. It's really nice. It's really easy. And it matters to these people. So that's my little story. I would say that um, there's things we can do that don't that are so easy and so meaningful. And if anybody else wants to learn more about this, call Tommy or call me and we'll get you involved. I know you probably feel good about it if you did. Thanks. In response to God's inexhaustible grace, let us have the same mind as Christ Jesus and pray for the world that he came to save. Let us pray. God, whose heart knows no bounds, your love is higher than the mountains, wider than the seas, deeper than the valley. We love you, God, because you first loved us. We pray because even now Christ prays for us. We hope because you are a God of promise, saying to us that though the sorrow may last for the night, your joy comes with the morning. So, God of light, allow your saving power to dawn upon us and upon our world. We pray for your church in every place, that we may worship and serve you faithfully, kneeling to wash feet, following your footsteps towards suffering for leaders and people in every land, that they may know your way and do your will, for Muslims and Jews and people of all faiths, that they may worship in freedom and without fear, that your blessing and kindness might descend upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For justice throughout the world, that there may be peace and plenty for all. For an end to this grievous pandemic, for redemption of our outrageous inequities. Lord, teach us to love our neighbors across the street, across the city, and across the oceans. For the earth you have made, that it may flourish in beauty and show your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who hunger and thirst, that they may be filled with good things. For those who are ill or close to death, that they may know your loving care. For all those whose burdens feel heavy, whose spirits are lagging, that they may know your rest and your sweet care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we pour out our hearts in prayer, O God, lead us to pour out our lives in service to you, ever seeking your will, ever following your way. For we pray in the name of the one who teaches us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, Go forth this day in hope and in joy to love and serve the Lord in every single thing that you do and abide always in God's peace. 
Remember, we did not leave the church. We went forth to be the church. So as you do so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.